Uh, good morning. So um, thanks, Jim, for that very nice introduction. Um, here I'm going to tell you about um, a project we've been working on for the past approximately three years. Um, as Jim mentioned, I work on a lot of different things. I work a lot on uh, the human genome and human annotation. I work on bacteria and viruses. Uh, but for about uh, eight years now, I've also been working on tree genomes. And in particular, uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, two genomes we've been working on the last couple of years, the giant sequoia and the coast redwood. Um, so this is a project we call the Redwood Genome Project, um, initiated by my colleague David Neal uh, at UC Davis and, and funded by the Save the Redwoods League privately in California. So, um, and, uh, so we actually announced the first results of the project about six months ago. Um, some of you might, if you live in California, you're more likely to have seen some of these uh, headlines because they were more in California than here. Um, and what we, um, and, I and I described this at the Cold Spring Harbor Biology Genomes meeting a little bit too. Um, so what this announcement was about was the uh, initial assembly of the redwood genome and a second assembly of sequoia, which I'm going to tell you a lot more about in the next uh, uh, 18 minutes. Um, so um, let's start with giant sequoia. So these, uh, these two trees are two of the largest trees on Earth, two of the largest living things on Earth. Um, sequoia itself is the largest tree species on Earth. Uh, individual sequoias can live 3,200 years or more. Um, and so there's really cool trees. If you've never seen them, uh, you have to go to California to see them. So sequoias and redwoods both live in California and only in California. There are actually three redwood species on the planet. There's a third species called dawn redwood, which is in China only. Um, so all of the sequoias, uh, the giant sequoias and, and coast redwoods live are only in California. So um, the tree that we're sequencing is approximately 1,360 years old. It's 96 meters or 316 feet tall. Um, it's the tallest known sequoia in the world. And um, I can't tell you where it is because I don't know. Um, its location is being kept secret, and, and this is true of our redwood as well. Um, that's because the, the redwoods in particular are, are quite endangered. Uh, we humans chop down most of them uh, over the past couple hundred years. Sequoias are not as endangered because they, they're, they're more in very mountainous regions. Uh, but nonetheless, if we were to lease the, the, the uh, location of this, uh, we're concerned that uh, tourists might go and visit the site, and that could damage the environment around it. Um, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, and its genome is very large, about eight and a half billion base pairs. And this is a property, and I'll tell you more about the redwood as well, it's a property of, of all conifers that they have really large genomes. And just a little background on conifers. Uh, in, in these projects I've been working on on trees, I've worked on a variety of types of trees, but conifers are one of them. Um, starting with loblolly pine, which is a perfectly ordinary, not particularly big tree, but they all have really big genomes. Uh, loblolly pine has a genome of about 21 gigabases. We published that about five years ago. And that's because they are filled with repetitive DNA, transposable elements, uh, that, and apparently there was a large uh, uh, expansion of these transposable, transposable elements about 80 or 90 million years ago. So they all share these really big genomes, but obviously it didn't really cost them anything evolutionarily, so they are able to survive just fine. So the status of our Sequoia project is we actually finished sequencing two years ago. Um, the assembly, because these really big assemblies take a long time, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, um, the assembly finished uh, about a year ago. We go through multiple rounds of assembly for these things. Um, and then we did scaffolding with Dovetail, and I'll say more about that too. Um, and that finished in March, so right before the announcement we made in April. Um, so the second tree I'll tell you about today is Coast Redwood. Um, we're not as far along in the project, but it's, it's, it's well underway. Um, so this is the tallest tree species on Earth. The, red, the sequoia is the largest by mass. Redwood is the tallest. The current record holder is just under 380 feet or 115.7 meters tall. Um, the redwood is highly endangered due to habitat loss. And individuals um, can live over 2,000 years, not quite as old as sequoias, but a really long time. Its genome is much bigger on the order of 27 gigabases. Um, that's because it's hexaploid, so it essentially has three equivalent genomes to the sequoia all in one. And when David Neal first approached me with the idea of sequencing the redwood, I was uh, a little bit uh, uncertain about whether we should try to do this, because not only is it gigantic, but it's also hexaploid, meaning the assembly could be uh, impossible. So um, as you'll see, it wasn't impossible, but it's been challenging. So our tree is 107 meters tall. You notice it's about 10 meters taller than our sequoia. Not the tallest in the world, but it's still very tall, 350 feet. Um, it's about 1,390 years old, and like the sequoia, its exact location is being kept secret. I don't know where it is. Um, 
So the status of the Coast Redwood sequencing, we finished sequencing the Illumina portion of that. We finished uh, two years ago in December 2017. The nanopore sequencing was finished um, uh, about six or seven months later. Oh, I should mention that all the nanopore sequencing for both these trees is being done in my colleague Winston Timp's lab um, at Johns Hopkins. So we did er everything through him with uh, a, a technology that was at, over the course of the project has actually improved quite a bit. And you've heard more about that at this meeting. So we finished the initial assembly just uh, uh, six months ago in March, and we're now scaffolding it with um, the high-rise scaffolder that's in partnership with Dovetail Genomics. Um, they finished making their Chicago and high-rise libraries a couple months ago. Scaffolding is still underway. And there's a little graphic showing you how tall these trees are next to a 10-story building or a sort of normal apple tree. Um, so here's how we do the assembly. So I, I, assembly has been a part of my lab's work for all, about 20 years now, I, I reluctantly admit. Um, and the technology has changed dramatically. And I still remember back in the early 2000s, soon after the human genome was published, uh, and, and the community was starting to do other animal genomes, um, someone, I don't remember who, asked me, so isn't assembly pretty much solved now? What are you going to work on next? And I said, well, it's not really solved. And in fact, you might not know, but the human genome is not done. Um, and here we are in 2019, the human genome is still not done, although we're getting closer. Um, and uh, thanks to the innovations of technologies like Oxford Nanopore, you keep giving us, you keep basically making all the old software not work anymore because the sequencing is all different. So we have to design new methods and new software. So our current favorite recipe, which we probably will change in a year or two again, but our current recipe is to use a mixture of short and long reads. So we use Illumina because it's very cheap, very high throughput, and the error rate is very low. Uh, and we use Nanopore because, as you all know, the reads are very long. Um, the throughput is getting better every, every week, it seems. Um, and in fact, we can do some, we, we need, it has a higher error rate, and that's why we need the Illumina reads. The error rate for Nanopore, of course, is improving, and if it gets good enough, maybe we can go someday to just long reads only. But this is our current recipe. Um, and what we do is we generate the, there's another special trick we do just for conifers. And we've done this for, we did this for Loblolly Pine and several other conifers, and we're doing it for Sequoia and Redwood as well. And that is, you want to get as much data as you can from a single seed, or what you call a pine nut. Um, this is a, a technically a redwood nut. Here's a picture of one. It's very small. There's a lot of DNA in there, though. Um, it has a special feature that the, um, the, 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 the nuts from these conifers are haploid. Um, every nut in the tree, every seed in the tree is different because of recombination, so you can't just take a pile of seeds, unfortunately. So you pick one. Uh, and you kind of peel off the outer part, and you get what's called a megagametophyte, and all the DNA in there is haploid, which makes assembly much, much easier, uh, because we do not have inbred trees, and we certainly can't breed them. They take far too long to do that. So we can get enough DNA, as we did here, to get um, a lot of uh, Illumina uh, reads out of it. So we generated uh, about 135x coverage of, in Illumina reads, all from a single seed. So that's very handy. So our, our Illumina assembly uses haploid DNA. Um, and the algorithm we're, that we use is called Mazurka. Some of you are probably familiar with this. This is uh, an assembler developed by, led by Alexi Zimmen, a scientist in my group. And he's been maintaining this for more than 10 years. The software has changed so much that it's the only thing that's the same about it now from 10 years ago is the name. Um, but the current software includes um, a, a hybrid method that mixes these Illumina reads and these Nanopore reads uh, in a way that I'll just give you one technical slide here to tell you sort of how it does it. So we basically take the Illumina reads, and those are kind of shown here in green. We sort of merge them together to make these things called super reads, which I don't have time to explain. But they're slight. Think of them as like Illumina reads, only maybe twice as long. And then we, uh, then we align those to the nanopore reads. So the nanopore read here is shown schematically in blue. And these Illumina reads, or super reads, are shown in green above it. Um, and we then basically replace the sequence of the nanopore read with these tiled super reads. So now we've got something which is much like it's the same length as the nanopore read. It might have a gap or two, but it's the same length. And the quality of the sequence is the same or better than the Illumina quality. Actually, these super reads have better quality because they're usually a pile up of multiple Illumina reads. Um, and uh, we then just basically replace the nanopore sequence with this mega read, we call it. Um, and because we know in this case, I showed you there's a gap. Um, so if there's a gap, if we, don't, if we don't tile the entire nanopore read, then we create a, a, a sort of synthetic pair of reads from the mega read sequence themselves to link those two together so the assembler can keep those in the same place in the final assembly. So that's a little bit of technical detail about what's going on under the hood. Um, so for the sequoia we generated, um, this was two years ago, so these read lengths are not at all impressive compared to what, you, what I heard yesterday. But we generated about 24 million reads. 
Um, a total of 184, 82 billion base pairs, or about 22x coverage, um, and uh, N50 read length of 9,500 base pairs. And this all came from needles from the same tree. And of course, it all has to come from the same tree. Otherwise, you end up with lots of heterozygosity that you don't need. But the needles, of course, are from diploid material. And I should also mention that the way you get these seeds and the needles, you have to go to these trees and somebody has to climb them. The first branch is typically on the order of 100 feet up in the air. So there's a collaborator of my collaborator. Um, uh, his name is Steve Sillett. There's a book about him, um, about him and his experience with the trees. He's apparently about my age, but he still does this. So you stand at the base of the tree and you take an arrow tied to a very thin rope and you shoot it over the lowest branch and then that rope is tied to a thicker rope and then you pull the rope up and then, he, then, up, then up he goes. So that's how he got the seeds and the needles for us. Um, and we can get all the needles we want. So there's plenty of DNA from those. Um, so let me just give you a quick, uh, very quickly um, show you how just the software has improved over the past few years. So we've done a lot of these conifer genomes. This is showing you some stats from our assembly of Loblolly pine, which was the first one we did, and Douglas fir, which was the third conifer that we did. And I just wanted to highlight right in the middle here that the N50 contig size has increased from, increased over the course of about three years. Is this working? Yeah. From 8.2 KB, which sounds really small, right? That's like a read. But anyway, that was our N50 contig size when we published this. The scaffolds were bigger. Um, and our N50 contig size of Douglas fir, which used the same all alumina kind of strategy, was 44 KB. So that got a lot better. But those are not very um, big. So here's our um, initial sequoia assembly. Before we had the nanopore data, we went ahead and assembled the alumina data. Um, we got an assembly with an N50 contig size of 12 KB. Then when we subsequently finished the nanopore sequencing, we reassembled with the nanopore data, and that went to 360 KB, so dramatically bigger. And the number of contigs was initially 2.5 million, so a lot of pieces. Um, after adding in the nanopore data, it went down to 50,000. Still a lot of pieces, but they're much bigger and certainly many fewer of them. But we weren't done, so then our third step is to scaffold uh, using high c And I don't really have time to explain how this technology works, but uh, others have mentioned it here at the conference, and I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk to anybody afterwards if they want to know. We've been partnering with Dovetail Genomics for this genome and for some others um, to do this scaffolding and using their software, which is called HiRISE. So our recipe is basically mix these two types of data, assemble with Mazurka, scaffold with HiRISE, and we've been successful in several projects now getting uh, scaffold length chromosomes, which has been just uh, transformative for us. And if you've been doing assembly for 20 years, it's pretty amazing to me that you can get scaffold like chromosomes. Just as a sort of an, a quick aside, we use the same recipe for the walnut genome. Walnut's a sort of normal sized tree uh, in both physically and genome size. It's about 550 megabases, 16 chromosomes. This is just showing you a map of aligning our scaffolds to some independent mapping data showing that for all, we had 16 s scaffolds, each corresponding to a whole chromosome, and they were almost perfectly consistent with genetic map data. This is not published yet, but it's in BioArchive, and there's a link there. The paper's been submitted. Hopefully, it'll be published soon. Um, and that was done several years, actually, even though it was just put in BioArchive, we did the nanopore sequencing several years ago. This just shows you, here was our, our, in, our distribution of read lengths for the walnut genome. You see we were getting 2 to 3 KB read lengths, and sequoia far, far bigger. Um, but even with 2 to 3 KB, with a much smaller genome, we were able to get uh, chromosome-sized scaffolds. Um, so sequoia, we had a pretty spectacular result, which I didn't believe it at first. Um, when when uh, Dovetail came back to us with his first result. We had 11 enormous scaffolds. The smallest was 171 megabases. The biggest was 1.8 gigabases. And then we had 8,200 smaller ones. The biggest of those was 650 KB. So these are all tiny, but there's these 11 gigantic things. Um, we know that the sequoia has 11 chromosomes, so that was uh, interesting. And we said, well, are these chromosomes? Are these the 11 chromosomes? So we had no mapping data whatsoever. So this is the only information we have about is what's here. So you know, this company, Dovetail, gives us the scaffolds. Do we believe it or not? So we did a lot of work to convince ourselves that these are accurate. We did find that that really big one, the 1.8 uh, gigabase one, was, a, was a f an, an erroneous fusion of two chromosomes. So we found, we identified the centromeric repeats, and we identified, identified those in all these scaffolds. We also identified the telomeric repeats, which should be on the ends of chromosomes. And we found that this scaffold looked like this, with a telomere in the middle and two centromeres. So we split it right there to create two chromosomes. And then this is our final assembly, which has been released. Um, and we have 11 chromosome-sized scaffolds. Um, and you can see over here that most of them have both telomeres on both ends. We've sequenced all, we assembled all the way to the telomere. Most, all of them have a centromere, except for this little guy here. So we have a 12th guy, that 171 megabase piece. And that has a telomere on it and almost certainly goes 
on the end, there's three chromosomes where we only have one telomere. So that goes on one of those, but we're not sure which one. So it's really quite a spectacular assembly, which, uh, and if you compare it to what we were getting for Loblolly Pine or Douglas fir, it's truly spectacular. And I have to brag a little bit that the big one there, the 985 gigabit megabases, that's the biggest scaffold ever assembled for any genome, and nobody can break that record unless they get a bigger genome, right? So it <laughs> doesn't matter how good your assembly is if the genome doesn't have a scaffold, does, doesn't have a chromosome that's a gigabase, you can't break this record. So some would will, but it's ours now. Um, <laughs> So we just finished annotation literally like a week or two ago. I, so I have a count for how many genes. We think there's about 38,000 protein coding genes, and we're doing the analysis now. Um, oh, so now I have only like four minutes left. So let me talk about Coast Redwood. This is underway. Um, it's hexaploid, as I said before, 27 gigabases, three times the size. We finished sequencing um, a little over a year ago. It was enormous amount of sequencing, 3.2 trillion bases of Illumina reads and Illumina reads and 582 billion bases in Oxford nanopore reads, all again in the latter part, all in Winston Timp's lab, um, which he generously uh, let us um, sort of take over for part of this. Um, so uh, the, I sort of already said this, so there's our, our Illumina data, so a kind of crazy amount of, of DNA. Uh, we did find this interesting sort of side note. I'll spend 10 seconds here. We found a fungal genome in the Illumina data, so that's, that pine, that seed that we had. Um, there must have been a fungus growing in it, and we found actually pretty deep coverage of a fungus, so we've assembled that separately. It's about 40 megabases. Uh, we haven't written it up yet, but we figure we, we ought to do something with that. Um, so we gave it a name tentatively, but anyway, I don't have time to talk about that. So the nanopore data, um, here's our nanopore data. As I said, there were 581 or 582 billion base pairs, the N50 length of those of over 12 KB, and uh, quite a lot of reads that are longer than 20 KB and, and, and also longer than 50 KB, all of which makes the assembly better. Um, we then, assembly of such a huge data set takes uh, actually longer than the sequencing, um, so we needed a two terabase RAM computer, which we had. Actually, I bought it in preparation for this. And uh, error correction took 330,000 CPU hours, and the rest of the assembly took another 700,000 CPU hours. And we ran this all in parallel on many machines wherever we could. It still took five to six months to assemble. So even though we finished the uh, sequencing like a year ago, the initial assembly, as I said, we announced it in April, because that was like right when, we had, when the first one was done. And that's not with scaffolding, so we're still working on that. So here's our assembly results. We have a half a million scaffolds, total length of about 26 and a half gigabases. The longest contig is pretty nice. It's 2.4 2 megabases, but the N50 contig size is 110 KB. Not great. If you remember earlier, the Sequoia initial assembly was 360 KB. So it's not as, not as good. It's a much bigger genome, and there's probably uh, more complications caused by it being hexo hexaploid. But nonetheless, we're, um, we're proceeding with scaffolding, and that has been running for uh, two to three months, and it's still running. So um, uh, stay tuned. And by the way, all this data is publicly available on, our, on our, both the Sequoia and Red, Redwood, and I'll have this link up again. If anybody wants to take a look, um, it's, it's out there. Um, the final thought, and this is my, uh, this is my last slide, so I'm going to be on time. Um, so because Redwood is hexaploid, we had this thought that now we, and now we have contigs and scaffolds. Um, there are three subgenomes, so three ancestral species whose genomes were merged. Um, one of which should be sort of like sequoia, and the other two are not are, are, are species that no longer exist. And so we thought, well, maybe we can take those contigs or those scaffolds, scaffolds would be easier, and bin them into three piles corresponding to the three subgenomes. And we've had a few ideas that we've tried, and we've been unable to do it. But if anybody's interested, um, we'd welcome more collaboration. The team is very small. Um, so if anybody wants to take our, take our data, download it, and try to, to do this, um, there should be three subgenomes, two of which should be, from what we know, should be closer to each other than, the, uh, than to the third one. Um, so um, we are sort of would welcome any more help on that. Um, so we haven't finished scaffolding, and so we haven't even started annotation yet for this one. So that's our sort of progress report on the Redwood Genome Project. Um, let me just thank the people involved in, in my lab over here. Um, at Hopkins, the main people who worked on this were, well, of course, Winston, whose lab we sort of took over for a lot of sequencing. Several members of his lab, as well as members of my lab, have worked on the sequencing and the assembly. Save the Redwoods League has been supportive both on the fi financial side and also scientifically. Emily Burns uh, works on it there. And then David Neal, who's pictured here, has led the whole project from start to finish. All the data is available at the Redwood Genome Project site, but also at our FTP site. Thank you.